You clap till we sit down. That's generally how I do here. Jason, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Congratulations on your novel. This, what is this, like uh, eight? Nine, nine. Nine? I think, yeah. That's insane. And you just started publishing just a few years ago, right? Uh, I like, it's been 13 years. It's been 13. <laughs> nine novels in 13 years. I started is, publishing novels three years ago. Three years ago, you, yeah. started, you started like writing. Yeah, I had poetry 13 years ago. You had poetry. And so this is a novel in poem. In, in verse. In verse. In verse, yeah. yeah I should know. I should know. That's right. I, mean, I read. There's, there's, a slight, there's a slight distinction only because you just have to be careful with what we call poems. Right. right? Shakespeare didn't write in poem. He wrote, wrote in verse. There you go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What made you lean on verse to tell this story? I mean, I just think that because the story is, is focusing so much on trauma, I think that poetry gives us a certain freedom when it comes to how we can sort of shape language on a page, uh, composition and framework and, and format to sort of um, evoke psychologically what trauma might feel like. I think everything in the story should mimic this young man's brain. And I think um, poetry, very specifically, uh, this particular way does that the best. Did you have a hard time crafting the ex, uh, exposition of the story into the verse at times? Not really. And, and the reason why is because I wrote the book originally in vignette. So it was written in prose, oh. originally, originally. And then my agent was like, you know, you've been saying that you want to write something in verse. This is a good opportunity. Maybe try this one in verse. I think the people around us help us to sort of flesh out uh, our ideas when we can't quite get them. And so the story was already written in terms of the exposition and all. It was just transferring it uh, into verse that sort of created um, sometimes an interesting complexity. What's your, what's your, what's your writing process? Do you, how often do you write? Every day. Every day. Every and day. are you like, I wake up, I write for a couple hours, or are you like, I'm writing over the course of the day? What, what, what's your uh, habit? Well, when I'm not traveling, which is these days very rare, uh, but when I'm not traveling, I get up at 6.30 in the morning. By, seven, by 7.30, I'm typically out of the house, and I work from about 8 o'clock to about 2 o'clock in the afternoon every single day that I am not traveling, and then I go to the movies. Like, you go to the movies? And then I go to the movies. Why do you go to the movies? Because the movies is almost like the, uh, like the cool down laps when you're running track, right? The movies, the movies is a way for you to still be exercising the muscle, but exercising it passively. And second of all, the movies is the way for you to, it forces people like me to unplug, right? Phone, phone down, yeah. computer off, right? I get to sort of focus on a singular thing, still be quote unquote working and be sort of rejuvenating and being filled up um, after I've poured so much out. How much of your phone is off and things are off when you're writing? It's supposed to be. Yeah, it's yeah, supposed yeah. to be off. You're like, I got a paragraph done. What's going on? That's with exactly Twitter? what happens, right? It's like you write, it's like, oh, I got a page and a half. I'm a, like, and it's always when you're like hitting your flow, right? It's like, yo, I'm yeah. in it, I'm in it, I'm killing it. And it's like, woo, I'm killing it. Right? And then you like, weird, It's the weirdest thing. And then you catch yourself, like, why am I doing why this? Am to I, doing I was actually this? doing a good job. The story of my life. You know? <laughs> I went out and I had to buy a new phone, I bought a separate phone without anything on, like a regular phone with that just calls and receives calls because it was becoming so distracting. I'm thinking about doing that. I'm thinking about getting just like a flip phone that I can yeah. text or just get calls from. And then I'm thinking about getting like a word processor computer that doesn't do not have else. Wi-Fi on it at all. Isn't it a shame? It's a strange thing, right? Like we have to do these things. We have to do what we have to do. But it's like, uh, what an addiction, right? What an ad I mean, yeah, absolutely what an addiction. These things are, my addiction goes to the point where we're not just like trying to get work done. I just actually don't want my brain to click into that space ever or feel like it needs to click into that space, whether I'm trying to accomplish something or if I'm just hanging out. I think we all could use a little unplug from the noise. Uh, and I think I, I, it's interesting when I'm, when I'm at the movies or, or even when I'm home alone and I finally have given myself a break from it, I, I remember what I sound like. Like in here, I remember what my thoughts sound like um, when the noise has been quieted. I recognize the brilliance and the strength of social media and all of this stuff, but I also recognize that it's dangerous sometimes and that we have to learn how to harness it better, so. What's the last movie you saw? Oh goodness, the last movie, what was the last movie I watched? Oh, I just watched um, Score. Have you guys seen, has anyone seen this movie? What's Score? It's a documentary on movie scores and on the best composers over the years who have literally, that we don't know have impacted our lives, but have impacted our lives greatly. So like the dude who did all the 19, late 80s movies, like all the, the early Steven Spielberg movies. Oh, John right? Williams, right? John Williams, yeah. so, so Jaws and E.T. and all those movies yeah. and how he created the cinematic um, soundscape that we're all are so used to. Uh, and then you think about like, you know, I mean, Hans Zimmer, yeah. right? And how Hans Zimmer sort of changed the game when he created this, his sort of sound and what he used um, from orchestral instruments to uh, sort of synthesizers. Like oh, man. Noising it up a little bit. And, yeah. and it's amazing because for, for a writer, for a storyteller, you realize that like storytelling is in everything and that they are as much of the story, as much as a sort of 
are part of the process of telling that story as sort of Steven Spielberg or anybody or the writers of the script, right? And that in my books, right, in books, you have things that you use that not everybody knows that you use, but that are basically doing the exact same things that movies do. For instance, if I'm writing in prose or even if I'm writing in poetry, repetition is an amazing thing to use to do certain things. If I wanted to do something that was psychologically um, uh, sort of jarring, every page or every two pages, repeat a line ver like verbatim, right? And what happens for the reader is there's a questioning of like, did I, I think I just read that. I'm not sure that I did though. And if you repeat it again, uh, another page, they're like, wait, I'm pretty sure, right? It, it's uncomfortable. It creates discomfort, right? Or if you are writing one word sentences and you're writing them and you're placing them in different parts of the page, how, what, what, what happens to the reader's mind as they're reading those things that it creates tension, it creates urgency, it does things. And I think that is literally me adding rhythm, music to a narrative, just like John Williams, you know? And those are things that you also find from working. Those are not ideas that you can kind of just come up with. I mean, what, what I always <coughs> find when I watch a documentary about other, other creatives, be they writers or musicians, is that everything that's great about them that I remember came from experimentation, failure, and yeah. work. Yeah, it's all about like, yes, all those things, right? Experimentation, failure, and work. I think for me, there's a certain level of freedom that needs to exist, and that freedom has to be the freedom to fail, right? The freedom to try something and miss, the freedom to break all the rules that we've spent years and years and years learning, right? L rules only matter if you have the courage to, to break them and to bend them and to make them what you want them to be, right? You can create new rules. All Everything that we do is derivative of a rule, right? But it's derivative of that rule, and it's usually sort of, um, it's usually the perversion of said rule, right? How can I take this thing where they say that a full sentence has to have this, that, and a third, and say perhaps a full sentence is actually actually the, the provocation of an emotion, and that it doesn't matter if it has sort of subject-verb agreement, agreement as long as it provokes an emotion, and that if it does that functionally, it is a sentence into itself. So that could be a, a single word, Right, like, and, and like thinking of things that way, I think, um, at least that's for me, that's the way that I approach it. How, can, how many rules can I break today, yeah. you know? Yeah, absolutely, and I think when you come up with those repetitions, you also, you find that, like, like that sentence that you're talking about that you repeat every second page, you're not gonna find that sentence until you sit down and start writing, and then you're gonna go, oh, that's the sentence, oh, I can bring that up here, exactly. and I can bring that up here. Exactly. Work, 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 right? Work, work and work in work. And it's like your editor, you bringing vignettes that you wrote to your editor and your editor being like, no, turn these into poems and you having to go, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Rewrite the book, right? Yeah, exactly. So cavalierly, it's like, hey, this is good. You should rewrite this whole book a different way. You're, right? You're fired. No. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, you know. So I, I was watching this interview with you this morning on CBS This Morning with the, the, the great Gail King. For sure. Wonderful Gail King. And she was, uh, you were talking about how you came to writing kind of late. Right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I came to writing prose uh, and, and fiction kind of late. I came to, I, my initial discipline was poetry, which is why this is no surprise. I mean, verse is where I'm most comfortable, um, though I've written so many novels in prose. Um, and the reason that po poetry sort of found me, right? I was a kid who grew up on rap music. And, um, you know, in the 80s and in the early 90s, rap music was sort of growing its legs. It was maturing. It was becoming a formidable uh, form of music. It was becoming a movement that would eventually take over uh, the planet Earth, right? Also far more about the MC in those days as it was, well, the late yeah. 80s, early 90s. It was all about, you know, the MC. And, and what they were representing was they were supposed to be reflections of, of, of all kinds of different slivers of the community. So I gravitated toward them. And it was in reading liner notes when I was 10 years old. Uh, opening up cassette tapes, pulling out the liner notes, and, and studying the rap lyrics that were written in those liner notes that I discovered poetry. That was my way in. Uh, and, that, those, and, that, and in that moment, I decided that when I get older, I'm going to be a poet, that I'm going to do this. I didn't read any books until I was 17 and a half years old. I didn't value um, the stories that were given to me because I didn't think those stories valued me. Um, now, you know, I'm looking for stories about, like, you know, sunflower seeds and ice cream chucks, right? The things I'm used to, the things, that, right? right? I'm looking, I'm looking for the, the boys on the block who are shooting dice. I'm looking for my uncle with the cigarette behind his ear. I'm looking for these sorts of things that you could not find in a book in the 80s and the 90s, not for young people. Yeah. So the rap music was my way. Um, I wrote poetry for years, and it wasn't until I was 26, 26, 27, that I started writing prose after a buddy of mine said, you know you could break these rules. You know you could put your voice, the voice that everyone's been telling you is improper your whole life, on the page. You can be authentic and you can be honest and you can you can sort of create your own sort of vision of your neighborhood and your family members and you can break all the rules doing it. And so I just kind of used intuition, got a little loose with it uh, and, and wrote what would eventually be the novel that changed my life. 
What was that? It's called When I Was the Greatest, a uh, novel about three young people, uh, brothers Needles and Noodles. Needles has Tourette syndrome and uses knitting as a way to keep the outburst down. Noodles is resentful of his brother having a mental difference, and Ali is the next door neighbor who's telling the story. Um, in real life, these three characters are all one person, my older brother. His, his teenage years split into thirds and then sort of woven into this interesting tale about family and friendship. How long did it take you? What was the process like writing your first novel? It was amazing. Because it was almost like, I, look, I don't know, I didn't know what I was doing, mm -hmm. so it was a free for all. I didn't have, there was no pressure. It was kind of like scribbling in a notebook. I used to work at Rag and Bone. I was managing the store, sitting, standing at the cash register, you scribbling. Managed Rag and Bone. Yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was at Rag and Bone, like scribbling in a notepad, um, and 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 it was. Is that how you got published? You were managing Rag and Bone, and like was, a publisher came in and. Well, like, well no, I, <laughs> I wish, right? Like a New York story. No, I, I was managing Rag and Bone. I had already been published um, years earlier by by Harper when I, with poetry. I'd already been published. I was twenty one, um, but I flopped, and I couldn't get anything else published. And so this would be the sort of second chance novel. This would be the second chance book, right? Well, the, the first novel, but the second chance book that would sort of, um, luckily, um, you know. I would, I would hit, I would get this one right. But it all comes from me not being afraid of getting it wrong. I just was scribbling my story. I'm, I was speaking in this sort of language that I normally speak in. Right, it's my voice. People reading like, yo, this sounds just like you. And it's like, yeah, that's all I got. Right, like I don't know no other way. Right, <laughs> and um, and that and that became sort of my a signature almost. It's a weird experience when you find that right because you you write for so long trying to shape it as something that you think it should be shaped as, and then all of a sudden you find this thing that you can just kind of write. You show it to someone, and that feeling of someone saying. Oh, this is the best thing I've ever written because it's like talking to you. Exactly. And it's, it sounds like you're, I get it now. Oh, my whole life, it's like, why can't I be Toni Morrison, right? <laughs> why, if I could only be Toni Morrison, right? And then I realized... So many reasons we all for, want to be for, Toni Morrison, listen, for, you know? for all the reasons, right? But on the flip side, it's like, there's already a Toni Morrison, mm -hmm. right? I need not be Toni Morrison. And, and I don't have to be Toni Morrison to carve out a space of value in this industry or, or, or whatever, or in my life for that matter. I could just be me. And that was the sort of the lesson. That was the, I broke the rule only to sort of rebuild a sense of self-identity, mm -hmm. right? And once claiming that self-identity in my own experiences, the rules didn't matter so much anyway because now I could set new rules because I could say that I'm, I am my own template. Uh, and that was a special thing for me. You're making me want to go home and write, man. Good. <laughs> Now, talk to me about, you know, you, you, you said a minute ago that, you know, you didn't really start reading until you were 17 and a half because you didn't, there were no books around that really appealed to you. Yeah. There was nothing around that felt like you, you related to and was telling a story that you knew. How does it feel to be doing that now for, for kids? Do you feel like you're giving them something to look to that they can relate to and a positive influence? I hope so. Uh, I feel like I am of, of service, man. I, I tell people all the time, I'm not... This isn't some sort of highfalutin gig where it's like everybody, I come in, when I come in every space I'm in, I want you to clap for me, I'm doing this work. Nah, for me, I feel like I'm of service. My job is to be of service to, to young people. Um, I believe that all of us should probably try to be a little more of service to young people. I don't feel like I'm, like I'm, I'm sort of bestowing some gift into them as much as I feel like these are all love letters, right? I'm writing love letters to young people to let them know that there's someone out here who sees them for who they are and not for um, what we all imagine them, imagine them to be, right? But for who they actually are, which is complicated, nuanced, whole individuals, even if only whole uh, at 16 and how that wholeness may change as you turn 17 and 18 and 19. In that moment, you are 100% who you are and that I should be okay with acknowledging sort of who you are and, and show you in a way that has some balance and some integrity and some honesty and some care and some love. I can't claim to love you if I don't represent you uh, on the page or if I create stereotypes or one-dimensional sort of caricatures of who we think teenagers are, which then perpetuates the idea of adults walking down the streets scared to death every time they see a group of young people walking toward them, right? Like the, the, the gift that I could give them is, is an I love you, and that I love you comes um, through a fair depiction, a fair depiction of what it means to be 15 uh, today. What made you want to start writing books about teenagers? Or when you started writing, is that just kind of what, what naturally flew out of you? It just kind of, you know, the industry's funny, and you know this. I mean, we get categorized. I didn't even know that this was a thing. I didn't know this was a genre or a category. No one told me uh, that there was a such thing as young adult. I mean, when I was growing up, there wasn't a young adult, right? I don't, I don't even know, um, like, I didn't know that was a thing. But they categorized that first book, the one that I got, the, the poetry book, they categorized that as young adult. 
And when they kept, because it was art and it was poetry, my, my, my dear friend Jason Griffin and I did it together. And it was art and it was poetry and it was a super creative thing. And they were like, this is for kids, right? And they categorized it as young adult. And so when I tried to get back in the game after years of not being able to publish anything else, I only had contacts in children's departments for publishing companies. So whatever was going to happen next, if I, if I had a shot at having a career, it was going to have to be in the vein of young adult because that was the only, that's who was in my Rolodex. Now, it just so happens that when I figured out what young adult actually was, I realized that this is an honor, yeah. that, I'm, that I'm grateful to be writing for young people, that we talk about this as if it's some slight, or like it's less than, but who else, like who better to be writing for than our young people? I don't know why I should be made to feel, it's a strange sort of hierarchy in the industry, right? It's, because Catcher in the Rye is a young adult book. And no, that don't is even like, get you know, me started. To kill a mockingbird, catch We can run the list, right? But there was no category, right? Right? But we can run the list, right? Um, don't even get me started. But I want to get you started. It, 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 but I mean, because that's the thing, right? There, there's the, the, the hierarchy that we sort of play by now is it's sort of a new thing. But even but if we were to do our research, I mean, even back then, right? They laughed at Harper Lee. Mm-hmm. They laughed at Harper Lee, and she ended up writing. One of, the, one of the most important American classics of all time, one of the most sold books in the history of our country and in the history of, 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 of American literature. And they laughed at her. Her, her, her contemporaries, her colleagues laughed at her because they said that she was writing a children's book just because she had a, children, a child protagonist. Yeah. Right? It was such a different thing. It was a new thing, right? A child protagonist. And I think, you know, she got the last laugh in that one. Oh, absolutely. Um, she inarguably changed the world for the better with that book. I mean, One that- book. <laughs> that book being read by high school students and middle school students, I, 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 I guarantee has created a lot more empathy in this world exactly. than, than pr- prior to it. And I think what, what else is there for us to do is, uh, other than pour into our young people to help them grow more empathetic so that when they get older, when they inherit the world, the mess of a world that, we, that we're leaving to them, they can do whatever they can do to make it better. What, else, what other responsibilities do we have, yeah. right? Let's get some questions from the audience. Who's right here? You hey, ask Jason. the question. Um, so, uh, so you recently had a book, uh, Miles Morales, that came out, or yeah. uh, you wrote, um, yeah. and uh, based on the comic book New Spider Man. Did you uh, approach Marvel for that, or did they approach you? And how much involvement did they have? And would you write a comic book uh, or a Version graphic novel? Yeah. Version? So Marvel, Marvel approached me, man. Um, nobody approaches Marvel. <laughs> nobody. Right, everybody does. Doesn't work that way, right? Um, now they approached me, and um, honestly, to be honest, to be completely honest with you, I didn't know who Miles Morales was. I didn't grow up a comic book kid. I, I, I knew Spider Man was, I knew Peter Parker, right? And they're like, "You want to write a Spider Man novel?" And I was like, "I don't think so." And they're like, "Miles Morales," and I was like, mm, "I don't think so." It's like I'm like, "Who is he?" It's like, "Oh, he's half black, half Puerto Rican," and I was like, "Maybe." Right, and then, and I started to be interested in it. Then I did some research, and I called my brothers, and they were all like, "Yo, this is a big deal." Uh, and then I ended up doing it. They gave me a ton of leeway. I mean, I have to give them credit. They, they. I think when you're hiring certain people to do a job, it's like you're hiring me for a specific reason and to, to bring whatever it is that I do to the page. But in order for it to work, you kind of got to let me do my thing, right? Like I only know how to do my thing, so you got to let me do my thing. If not, this was this is going to be a bust for everybody involved. Um, and they kind of, they, they really let me rock, man. They, I, I thought they was going to be super tight and, and, and restrictive. And there were some things that they just wouldn't let fly. But for the most part, it, it was wide open. I got to create so much of that book is, is coming out of my own brain. Um, and I'm grateful for that. Will I do a comic book or a graphic novel? Am I interested in that? I don't know. It's hard, man. It's different. And I would want, I think before I could say yes or no, I just think I would need to learn more about sort of how it works because I think it's disrespectful to think that just because I do one thing I can just jump into anything. There are people who spent their lives trying to write comic books um, and really working on like the craft of writing comic script, right? And before I just dive in and just take over because I have a name, um, I'd rather learn learn what, what it takes to do that and really respect uh, the craft of doing that because it's a separate craft than what I do. Um, so maybe, we'll see, you know. But with all things, I do my due diligence with all things, you know. It's one of the interesting aspects of our culture now is that everything is so easily accessible. It feels like a lot of people feel like everything is also easily attainable in terms of in terms of doing it. Exactly. You know, it's, it's such a strange true. thing. People have been working their whole lives to do a specific thing, to get good at a specific thing. And somebody else who's famous would just be like, yo, I'm writing a, I'm writing a children's book. And it's like, yo, I know somebody who spent 20 years trying to, trying to master the art of children's book and writing. Like, oh, can you get me him to write my children's exactly, book? Exactly, <laughs> you know, and this is tricky, you know, I don't want to be that person. Yeah. Uh, next question. Hi, yeah. 
I'd like to ask you about two arguably most important um, parts of your career. One of them was when you're like couch surfing, you're living in DC, you love go go music. And that moment when you decided you're like, I'm doing it, I'm writing the first book. I want to ask you about that moment and the second moment when you stopped writing and then Chris Meyer came up to you. Yeah. And then you restarted again. So that moment when you start again, what was going through your mind and what motivated you? Uh, you know a lot about me, which is, which is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so the first one, so the, all right, so the story about like the go-go music and the couch surfing, being in DC. So even before that though, there was, uh, I was 16. So this is the true story, I was 16. And I was like, I went to my mother and I had been writing all these poems. And I was like, I'm gonna write a poetry book. And my mom sort of laughed. And just the fact that she laughed was like, oh, now I'm really gonna, right? I'm like, oh, I'm totally gonna do this now, right? I've been like spite to get uh, you out of it. And I am the, I'm, a, I'm Petty Betty, right? It's like, for me, it's like, oh, I'm gonna show you, right? <laughs> and, so, and so I remember like working tirelessly on my mom's big old, like, you know, e-machine or whatever, Hewlett Packard or whatever it was at the time. And I'm, I'm writing these poems and it's like my 16 year old, sort of the way that I'm viewing the world as a 16 year old kid. And I look back on that stuff and I'm like, oh God. But I'm working, I'm working, I'm working. And then I end up calling this publishing company and we get, I pay all this, I call like an independent, a vanity press. And for those who don't know, vanity press is basically people who you pay them, they print, it's really a scam. You pay them, they print your book. They call it published. It's really just printed. It's the whole thing, right? But at 16, I'm like, this sounds good. I'm doing it. I spent all my, I saved up my money and I gave it to somebody. And um, she ended up, this this woman who eventually became one of my best friends, funny enough, ended up uh, editing this book. And then she, I paid her some money and she used that money to then send it to a printer because this is before the days of blurb and all these sort of ways that you could self-publish and she went and she had these books printed up and sent to my house and so here I have 500 copies of I got boxes of books that I then put in my mom's 88 Mazda 626 and I drove all over Washington DC and up and down the east coast at 16 17 years old selling these books out of the trunk of a car um, that was sort of the way that I like and it was that sort of process and that grind uh, making my own money, right? Ten dollars a pop, uh, perform, like you know, signing open mics just so I can like say a few words and say, "Yo, I got these books. Y'all want to help me? You know, do this, that, and the third. And I use some of that money to buy books in college. I use some of that money to get through my last semester of college when the money runs out. I use, I mean, th I supported myself by selling these books out of the trunk of my car, out of boxes, right? Um, and so that was the beginning of it, right? Like feeling like I could do a thing, and then and then later on in college, I my my dear friend Jason, who eventually would be the guy that I would write the first book that I got signed in twenty one uh, at Harper with, we maxed out credit cards and wrote this book about two young boys in college who had dealt with like breakups, their first heartbreaks, and it was this really a beautiful book. But I look back on it and like, God, it's so funny. It's called Self, and we were like nineteen years old, and and we spent thirty thousand dollars. Right, we maxed out credit cards because no one would no one would print the book because the the book had all this art in it, and every printer said, "Look, we only do full color printing. Like it's too expensive. We're not doing all this extra stuff." And so we had to get it printed by the print the people who used to print for the Smithsonian. I'm 19 years old, so we're calling the, the Smithsonian Press, which is Steinauer Press at the time, and we're like, "We got this book." They're like, "Okay, kid, we'll print it for you." We want a coffee table, hardback, silk pages. They're like, "All right, well, that's I'm 19." They're like, "Well, that's gonna cost you thirty thousand dollars." This is back, this is 2003. Anybody could get a high limit credit card, right? Any teenager could get any 18 year old, right? So we swipe credit cards, shoo, shoo, right? And, we, and that's the book we ended up bringing to New York and that's the book that eventually got me in the industry. Now when I quit, because I did quit, as you say, cause, and I quit because that book came out and it flopped, right? Beca because when it came out, it, just, it was the perfect storm. It just happened to come out at the exact same time that America went into recession. Publishing industries crumble, magazines, newspapers crumble. I lose my job, I lose my home, right? All this is happening, so I quit. No more writing for me. And then later on, three years later, Chris Myers, that's when he, he sort of steps into the picture and he says, yo, man, somebody gotta, you're not writing no more? No more writing. And he's like, well, who's gonna write the books that my father has been writing for 30 years? My father's getting older now, and you know him, and you know me, like, somebody's gotta do it. It's strange to have your friends with it. And I'm like, dude, why don't you do it, right? I don't know, right? And he's like, I think you should do it. I had never even written a prose novel. Um, but he knew me, he knew me, right? My intuition, he knew my disposition, he knew my experiences, he knew my story. He said, I think you should try to do it. And that's when I stood at that cash register and I scribbled down what eventually became when I was the greatest because one person believed that I could. You know, so thank you for that.
That's great. I think we have time for one more question right here. Hi. Hey. I think your mind is phenomenal. Thank and you. you're definitely a walk in poet. I'm a poet myself. For so sure. I, I understand exactly everything you said. My biggest question would be for other like writers, not only writers, but poets. Yeah. Where what advice would you give them to start in the terms of the publishing logistics of things? Like if At, they if they don't know where to start. Yeah, yeah. As a poet, yeah. um, so first I would say to all the poets in the room, poetry is the greatest thing I've ever learned to do, first and foremost. I just want to make sure, because I think people, either they underestimate poetry or they're totally intimidated by it. Um, and so for the poets in the room, I just want to make sure you understand that as I sort of matriculated through other forms of, of literature, the, the greatest hat trick I have is poetry. The only reason that I can write anything it's because I understand language. I understand how to manipulate language. And you learn that better than, poets know that better than anybody else, right? So that's the first thing. Second thing, though, in terms of how to sort of get yourself, the poetry world is very different than the prose world because it's all based on, there are, there are different sort of benchmarks, right? Journals, so like you have, to, you have to be published in journals and you have to be, there's, like a, there's a different sort of trajectory in terms of working your way up the ladder because poetry is all about reputation. It's all about sort of like, are you familiar? Have I, do we recognize the name yet? What has, she been, what has he or she been published in? Right? How many journals or, or what magazine or what sort of website and all this, that, and the third. And so there's going to be some grunt work involved. There's going to be some grunt work no matter what you're working on, by the way. So if you're scared to get messy, this ain't for you, right? There's going to be some work involved. There's going to be some rejection involved, right? And so I I would say pull up all the journals. There's so many of them. I mean, pull up all the journals and just start submitting. Just really start, go hard and know that you're going to submit 100 times and you're going to get rejected 90 and that's okay because you only need that 10, right? So just hustle up. The other thing I would tell you is um, at some, and don't be afraid of smaller presses. There's always this grandiose idea that we got to go with a major house. But like, the truth is, is that in poetry, you got Grey Wolf, you got Button, you got all these. I mean, Olio, who uh, um, Tayamba Jess just won the Pulitzer Prize for Olio. Olio is published by a little teeny press, right? Tiny. We won the Pulitzer Prize, right? There are, there are small presses that do really, really good work, have incredible editors. Do not be afraid of a small press because they're, they, they are your friend when it comes to poetry. And lastly, if you need an agent, if you want to look for an agent, what I would suggest you do, and I get tell everybody this, poets and writers, if you just Google poets and writers agents, every single year they publish an active list of agents, every single live working agent in the industry in New York and all over the country, and what they specialize in, go through it, look for people who, who represent poems or poet, poets, um, and just start querying to get some representation because the truth is, is that the best thing you could do is get somebody to work on your behalf. It's a, little, it's a lot easier. In the meantime, do your grunt work and do it by yourself. But like, do both of those things. Be, be trying to get an agent and be trying to get published in journals simultaneously. And once you get that agent, it'll it'll streamline uh, a lot of that work. All right. <laughs> that was amazing, Chase. <laughs> you, just, you just told someone how to get a career. Well, well it's, it's never quite that easy. You know what I mean? <laughs> that is like usually that is the most practical advice anyone has ever given from the stage. You know, usually it's like believe in yourself. I don't know. It's like you know, write every day. I don't do your thing. I don't know. You were like, no, look, there's agents here, and this is how you dig in. Like. Nobody told me that. Surprise! You didn't no. give your card out and like call Not me later. I'll, I'll find some. Nobody ever it. told me when I was coming up. There were no. The internet wasn't the internet that it is today. There was no way to, to know. I, sh I ran around New York City with books in my hand, thinking it was like rap music, handing out demos, yeah. Run, running into. That, that's the that's the way I did it because we didn't. There was no one to say that. So good luck to you, you. for sure. Uh, Jason, long way down is on shelves now. People can people can buy it and tomorrow, morning. tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, yeah, yeah. Shelves tomorrow morning and on Amazon and all the places that all you can places. buy books as well as. Uh, all of your other books. Thanks for coming in. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Jason Reynolds, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, man. Yeah.